Hello everybody, sorry I'm late. Don't know if you're there, but uh, I'm here. Had a little bit of a misfire because my able-bodied assistant, um, you know, is wonderful. she's wonderful. She's wonderful assistant and uh, I'm glad you're here. Glad you're along for the ride. We're doing Quest Facebook Live. It's just Facebook Live tonight from the Quest and I want to talk about heaven. Um, so bring Lynn Everly on camera? <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> That's Facebook. Oh, Lynn Everly can't come on camera because she isn't here. Um, so we've been talking about heaven for the last several weeks. In fact, m more than uh, just heaven. Uh, hi, Morg. Um, more than just heaven. We've been talking about what happens next. And this last weekend, we discuss the idea that next is not really a very good way to talk about what comes next. And what I mean by that is that, um, hi Kelly, glad you're here. It's good to see you online. Um, next is a, is a time idea, right? Um, so we've got past, that, that's what happened last. And then we have future, that's what will happen next. And although for us, um, what happens after we die is next, when we get there, it won't be next anymore, because there's no time. Time is a construct. Uh, hi, Monica. And so, I, I I had this question. I found this question last week. Uh, this statement, actually, that was written by uh, one of the church fathers 1,800 years ago. So uh, I'm not sure how I missed it all those years. Kim thinks that's about how old I am. Um, it, and what if? Um, eternity isn't endless time. What if eternity is the simultaneous presence of all time? In other words, there is no past, there is no present, there is no future in the next life, in eternity. What we experience is the present of every moment. Time is an issue that uh, we think is constant, but uh, physicists tell us, starting with Einstein and others, that time isn't a constant, that time is in flux, that actually bends, um, that uh, the farther you get away from uh, a gravitational uh, mass that's, that's creating its own gravity, the slower time goes, and that if you could actually get far enough away from something or close enough to a black hole, which is the opposite of mass, that um, time would slow to almost a standstill, perhaps even a stop. And um, all, all moments would be in that moment. So, I don't know, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, I would love to have a conversation and not just uh, me talking on the screen. Um, so the idea of that, to me, is remarkable. Um, the other idea that's remarkable is what physicists today call the multiverse. Um, what's the opposite of a multiverse? Opposite of a multiverse is a universe. And physicists tell us that we probably don't just have a universe. Uh, we have multiple universes in our universe. And um, it's quite, it's kind of, you know, mind-blowing. And I know that we're, we're here, and I'm certainly no expert in this field, but um, we're here to talk about what God has to say about life, but part of that is understanding um, some of these things, because the world that it was created is quite remarkable. And so, if the presence, uh, if eternity is the presence of all moments in uh, the present moment, simultaneous presence of all moments, um, then what did the apostle who wrote in the book of Hebrews mean when he said, um, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. He was talking about people who had died before us. We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Ah, uh, Owen is watching. Hi, Owen. I miss you, and I'd like to meet your little sister. So uh, let's uh, get together sometime and set up a time, Mark. I would love that. Um, so what does the apostle mean when he says we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses? Um, these witnesses are, are the people in, in the book of Hebrews who have already passed, passed away. We say passed away. Where did they go? Well, they just went to another spot in this multiverse. What if um, 
What if they're just in a, it's going to sound a little weird. What if, uh, hi Jane, glad you're with us and glad you're coming home uh, from Long Beach. What if um, there are other uh, dimensions in this universe and what if some of those who've passed are present in this room with us? We don't see them. Uh, that's hard to believe, you say. How couldn't you see them if you if they were there? Well, think about this. Would you think about this? I'm in a bit of a weird mood. Mm. Would you think about this with me? What if you were, uh, what if you had a radio? Remember those? <clears throat> An old-fashioned radio with a dial. You could turn the dial and you could tune to 88.5 and listen to, you know, the droning of public radio news. And then you could turn to 97.3 and get the excitement of Alice radio and hear pop music. Um, and there are, in the Bay Area, probably 50 stations in between those two stations. But you have to be vibrating to the same frequency as the station in order to receive it. So in the room that I'm in, Kim's sitting here, her daughters are in the next room. Uh, in this room, there are literally hundreds of radio stations flying through the air. We can't see them. In fact, there are several Wi-Fi signals flying through the air. We can't see them. And we only can pick them up if we have the right kind of device. If we're tuned into that device. And uh, I have to tell you that recent events in my life have given me pause about what happens. And uh, when I die, when my father died, where is he? Where are your loved ones? What is this great cloud of witnesses? What was up with Jesus uh, when he rose from the dead? Um, you know, if you read, if you read the scriptural accounts, the guy's going through walls. What's up with that, right? So, would you say there's a few things we don't understand? I would, I would say that. Um, in fact, I, I don't even understand yet what I don't understand. Especially about, uh, what is in store for us in the next life. In fact, it's really, uh, not... I don't think accurate to call it the next life because it's this life. You only get, you're, you're, you have one life. Your soulishness is one and it goes through lots of stages, I think. We're in one of those stages now, but when you move to the next stage, when your body becomes room temperature, um, I don't think that that next stage uh, is, is as uh, odd as we may think it is. We somehow think that what God does is hits the control alt delete button and everything is refreshed, right? All your old crap is swept away and um, it's all done. We sing, you know, I grew up singing all kinds of hymns about heaven. Um, not very many of them accurate. Uh, at least if you read what uh, the, for the Christian perspective, what the Bible has to say about heaven, not very many of the songs that I was raised singing are very accurate. They're kind of emotional and they're um, optimistic. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't a heaven, right? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is it's not what we thought it was. It's not, um, it's not us sitting on clouds playing harps, kind of floating along happily. It's not uh, everything, every issue that we've ever had all of a sudden going away and I think what it is, it's a continued, we continue on the trajectory that we're on. Now we see things that we didn't see before, and uh, I think, but it's still a time of great and beautiful growth. Uh, we have a lot to learn, and can you imagine if everything you had to learn, you had to learn in this life, and when you die, you didn't get to learn anything anymore? That doesn't seem like heaven to me. Because stagnation isn't what that is. And so uh, I, I think this continued expansion of who we are and becoming ourselves is what happens. Now, I don't know where it happens. Uh, and, and then beyond that, the Christian tradition suggests that that's not even the thing that we should hope in. But the thing that we should hope in is, you know, what I affectionately call getting your body back, resurrection. Um, so we've, we've really kind of glommed everything into one step. Say we die, go to heaven, uh, spend eternity with God. And when we think about eternity, um, 
when, when we think about eternity, we think of it as years and 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 years on infinitum. But it's not. It's not that at all. Because there's not. God isn't bound by time. What is the name that God calls himself? Uh, remember, book of Exodus, chapter, what is it, chapter 1? Moses sees a burning bush, steps aside to see this thing that seems so curious to him. The bush is burning, and yet it's not consumed. And he gets close to the bush, and God calls from the bush, Moses, imagine. Um, and Moses perks up. And God says, remove your shoes because the, the ground on which you stand is holy. And he does. And God says, I want you to go and I've got a task for you. Remarkable. Um, and Moses said, no, I can't do it. <laughs> and God said, yeah, you can do it. And Moses said, no, I can't do it. And God said, yes, you can do it. And Moses said, okay, well, maybe, but who should I say sent me? Right? And God said, uh, tell them that I am hath sent you. Uh, yod hey vav hey in Hebrew. Yahweh. The Yahweh has sent you. What is that? It's not a name. It's a tense. What tense is it? Present tense. <laughs> Wait a second. How? Present tense has sent you. That's what God says. Now we say I am. But it's, it's really what God is saying is present tense has sent you. I am that I am. I am. I just, I am. What is that? It is the eternal present tense. Why is that? Because there's no time in God's economy. Why is it that God knows what's going to happen tomorrow? Why is that? Because there is no tomorrow. Well, you know, in our world there's tomorrow, right? In God's world there isn't. So God doesn't know what's going to happen tomorrow because he has already designed it to happen and we just live through what God has already written, like uh, the writer of some new sitcom or Netflix series. That's not how this works. God knows what's going to happen tomorrow because God is already experiencing tomorrow. There is no such thing as tomorrow. See, when God introduces himself in the First Testament, he says, I am the God of Abraham, Moses, and Jacob. I am that God. Not, I was. Why is that? Because there is no past. There is no future in God's mind. There is only I am. I am the present tense one, the one who is always present tense. And so God doesn't know it's going to happen 42 years from now because he has a script that he's reading from. So and he doesn't move us around like puppets. Well, you have to do this because this is what I ordained. No, he knows what's going to happen 42 years from now because he's already living 42 years from now. It's already, he's already there. He's present in it. So what if eternity wasn't endless time, but every moment, what if eternity was um, the simultaneous presence of every moment in this moment? I think that that's what the case is. Now, I don't know that, right? But it makes sense to me. A lot of things fit into place. Um, the Apostle Paul, I'm going to put on my glasses, Kim. <laughs> <clears throat> the Apostle Paul um, writes... And he says things like this. There's this term in the Newer Testament, fullness of time. Remember reading that? Galatians 4.4. 4. Um, it, it, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth the Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Remarkable. Um, Ephesians 1, as a plan for the fullness of time, God has to unite all things in him, things in heaven, things on earth, everything uni unified. What does that word mean? It's a Greek word, plerao, and it just means... Um, filled up when when uh, when things have filled up and it's ready. It's like when your rain barrel overflows or when your bathtub overflows. When you leave um, something, you, you know, you just take take something overflowing. It's overflowing. It's full. It's full stop. And so when time was full, we don't think about that. We don't think about time being full. But that's kind of how God does it. He plays it. God plays time like a fiddle, and he lives outside of it. And yet, especially when he was born into the God-man, um, he was subject to it. Um, 
And so Jesus, when was asked what's coming next, he said, I have no idea what's coming next. You're going to have to talk to God about that. And because he didn't, when he, when he became, when he filled up the Jesus, when the Christ filled up Jesus, he kind of gave up the way that he could move back and forth and, and in and out of that whole thing and was subject to time. He didn't know the future. He wasn't a magician. But God knows the future. Now, it doesn't mean God's a magician. It, uh, magician. it means that God is already living in the future. God's already been to tomorrow. Because there's no such thing as tomorrow in the mind of God. So, where do we go next? Well, there's no next. Why is it that Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I now live in the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Why does Paul talk about past tense as present tense? Because he's beginning to understand this. Paul says, I have been raised with Christ. Wait a second. Our resurrection isn't for, you know, some ta time now? Some time now? The Apostle Paul is beginning to understand that we have all been crucified with Christ, and we have already been raised with Christ. In the mind of God, it's already done. You see, listen, here's where this all becomes important. How does God see you? God does not see you as broken, flawed, um, wounded, um, not perfect. God already sees you risen with Christ. It's time to live that way, you see. That's why Paul says, again, talking about time, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. He's always telling us to live as if uh, time we could live in time like God lives in time, understanding that what we one day hope for has already happened. Your resurrection has already happened. Now, you haven't experienced it yet, but I'm telling you it's already happened. God's already been there. He's already seen it. Our job is to grow into it. That's all. Jesus was... Um, hi, Jason. Glad you're with us, bro. Jesus was a significant, remarkable man because he, he began to understand these things. And you have to understand that you can only understand these things when uh, you stop thinking about them and start going, okay, that, that can't be right. And, and, and you kind of pour over it and pain brings you to the place where you ask good questions and you don't stop asking until you begin to see something new, something that you hadn't seen before. Because the answers that we were given, um, harps, clouds, wings, those aren't answers. Those are placations given to people who just want to know something, even if it isn't true. Um, how are we doing for time, Kim? 720. 720. So, let me read this passage to you. And... Um, Kim, you asked a question earlier and I missed it, but uh, something about pain. We'll come back to that if you think. But let me read this passage. And if you guys have questions, it's not like I'm not talking about things that should bring up questions. If you have questions, just ask away. If you go, dude, you're nuts. It's good yeah, to say that. <laughs> um, listen to what the Apostle Paul says. And, and if you want to get more of this, there's a newer testament book called Colossians. It's a, it's a mind blower. Um, but listen to this, Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. If Kim was thinking ahead, she'd have this up on, you know, so I could read it up on a computer screen somewhere. <laughs> listen to this. Now Christ is the visible expression of the invisible God. He existed before creation began. And by the way, that's where time was created. In the creation poem, Genesis chapter 2 and 3, time begins. First day, second day, third day, and the evening and the morning was the first day. Yeah, I know, Morgan. Me too. Um, so time began, Jesus, or Christ, now Christ, Christ existed before time began. For it was through him that everything was made, whether spiritual or material, seen or unseen. Through him and for him 
Also, we're created power and dominion, ownership and authority. In fact, every single thing was created through and for him. Now listen to this. Hang on to this sentence. And, and if you want something to kind of chew on, meditate on, um, this is a good one. He is both the first principle and the upholding principle of the whole scheme of creation. Some translations say he holds it all together. Now, what we know scientifically holds everything together is what? Yeah, gravity. Kim, Kim is like... A student. Yep. Gravity. 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 <sighs> gravity. The Christ is... And, 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 and so Google gravity. You will learn... Probably be surprised by the fact that no one knows what gravity is. Well, I know what it is. It's the Spirit of Christ. Christ is gravity. The gravity that holds everything together. The gravity that causes the tides that keep our earth moving correctly. The gravity that keeps us just far enough away from the sun so that we don't freeze and we don't burst into flames. Christ is the gravity. He is the first and unifying principle. He is the Logos. He is the Tao. We just read that yesterday in Morning Joe. Um, so this Christ, this eternal spirit of Christ, that's beyond time and beyond measure, was funneled into uh, the, the infant body of Jesus. Um, and Paul talks about that. Philippians chapter 2. Um, and Paul says it in ways that uh, make me feel a little bit uh, silly. Like, oh, okay. Listen, um, your, your, your mind, let your mind be like the mind that was in Christ Jesus. Mind. It's not the word brain, it's the word nous in the Greek. Your center. Your center should be like the center that was in Christ who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Self-emptying love. <laughs> the gravity that holds the universe together poured himself into the body of a human being, because of love. That's all. That's all there is. And, and that's how that creative force feels about you. Love. Why? Now, I say all the time, you're magnificent, and it's true. But the love isn't there because you're magnificent. The love is there because of the lover. Because... The other, the other name for this gravity source, this spirit of Christ, this eternal Tao, is love. So, what is coming next? That's not the right question. The right question is, what are you willing to expand your understanding to experience now? And what, Because what you experience now will go on forever. Not because forever is an unlimited number of years, but because forever is the simultaneous presence of every moment in this moment. That's what heaven is. When you, uh, remember when you were young, I can remember my father um, carrying me out of my bed and putting me in the back seat of a Volkswagen van and going on vacation. And I would wake up and we'd be there. No time really passed in my mind because I was sleeping. Um, I think that people who go on to the next life before we do uh, will look up one day and go, Oh, good to see you. Not because they've been sleeping, but because the presence of every moment is simultaneous in that consciousness. We don't have it now. Now, uh, we got to talk more about that, maybe make a note, because I think living a life in union with Christ allows you to experience that now more and more and more now um, but we're, we're not that close to union to see it 
I even think if you begin to live a life in union with Christ to the extent that's possible, you'll see more than you can ever imagine. So, um, this is about time to go, I think. Uh, I'm glad you guys are here, and I hope that this is helpful. I need you to know that um, every name that came up on the screen, there's Dawn um, and John. Um, every name about... Uh, that's come up on the screen uh, represent people that I care about very much. Now, John asked a question. Let's see what he says. Uh, you made a statement about how God sees us. I, however, disagree with you and agree with God as revealed in his word. God sees us as spiritually dead. Well, yes, John, he may. He, he um, in fact, right? So he sees us like we are. So when he saw Peter, Let's just use an example. When he saw Peter, um, he saw him as Simon, son of John, but changed his name. So when Christ, when the Spirit of Christ sees us, when God sees us, God doesn't see us as we are. God see us, sees us as we will be. Um, under the umbrella of the beauty of the Christ. When God sees you, John, he sees Christ. He, he, we have been adopted into his family, and um, the love that God has for you is not based on what you've done or not done. It's based on God. If when God saw me, he saw what I deserved, how I deserved to be seen, I would be in deep trouble. But what grace is, is simply God seeing me in the spirit of his son, the Christ. And with that, I'm out of time. So, Follow-up questions, John, we can have a conversation offline. I would love that. Um, so ask away, bro. Um, great to hear from you, and I hope all is well with you. Um, so good night, everybody. Have a good, uh, a good evening, a good sleep tonight, and uh, maybe I'll see you tomorrow. Good morning, Joe. All right, good night.